Do they seem to be Londoners? <laughs> I believe they may. As sure as can be, one of them must be the gentleman that's coming down to court my sister. <laughs> Desire them to step in and I'll set them right in a twinkle. <laughs> gentlemen, I'll be with you in the squeezing of a lemon. <laughs> <laughs> There's no fairy tales. There's nothing befuddles the soul. So much as your freak and your legend. There's never so fairy tales. The tedious, uncomfortable day we've had of it. We were told it was but 40 miles across the country, and already we've come above three scores. So all Marlowe, from that unaccountable reserve of yours, that didn't let us inquire the way. My own Hastings, I'm unwilling to lay myself under an obligation to everyone I meet, and often stand the chance of an unmannerly answer. For the present, however, we're not likely to receive any answer at all. <laughs> no offense, gentlemen. I'm told you've been inquiring for one Mr. Hardcastle in these parts. Yeah. Do you know what part of the country you're in? Not in the least, sir, but we thank you for information. You know the way you came? No, sir, but if you can inform us... My gentlemen, if you know neither the road you were going nor the way you came, the first thing I have to inform you is you've lost your way. Yes, well, we needed no ghost to tell us that. Mm. Pray, gentlemen, you, gentlemen, is not this same Hardcastle a, a cross-grained, old-fashioned, whimsical fellow with a ugly face, a daughter, and a pretty son? <laughs> we have not seen the gentleman, but he has the family you mentioned. The daughter, a, a tall, traipsing, trolloping, talkative maypole. The son, a... Pretty, well-bred, agreeable youth that everybody's fond of. Our information differs in this. The daughter is said to be well-bred and beautiful. The son, <laughs> an awkward booby, reared up and spoiled at his mother's apron string. <laughs> then, gentlemen, all I have to tell you is you won't reach Mr. Hardcastle's house this night. Unfortunate. It's a cursed, long... Dank, bark, doggy, dirty, dangerous way. Oh, Zoom. Well, what's to be done, Marlowe? Well, perhaps the landlord can accommodate us here. No, in fact, Master, there's but one spare bed in the whole house. And to my knowledge, that's taken up by three lodgers already. I've hit it. What if you go on a mile further to the Buck's Head? Huh? The old Buck's Head on the hill? Oh, one of the best inns in the whole country. Oh, my oh. Man, splendid. A mile up the road, you say? You show you be incentive to your fathers as an inn to you. Mum, you fool. You have only to keep on straight forward till you come to a large house by the roadside. Drive up the yard and call stoutly about you. Oh, we're obliged to you. I, I tell you, though, the landlord is rich and wants to be thought a gentleman. He'll be forgiving his company and a card if you mind him. He'll persuade you his mother was an alderman and his aunt a justice of peace. <laughs> <laughs> but it keeps the best wines and beds of any in the whole country. Well, if he supplies us with these, we will forgive him the rest. Straightforward, it is Straightforward, gentlemen. <laughs> They call him, gentlemen! <laughs> no, Stingo, what do you think of that? Bless your arms! Here! Whoa, 
God, it's the bell. Ecod, yes, the bell. E, it's Mr. Marlowe and his friend. They're here. Welcome, gentlemen. Most welcome. Uh, come this way. Well, oh, child, the pleasures of a clean room and a good fire. Oh, upon my word, a very well-looking house. Antique, but creditable. Uh, the usual fate of a large mansion. Having first ruined the master with good housekeeping, it at last comes to levy contributions as an inn. Uh, but <laughs> pray remember, we passengers are to be taxed to pay all these fineries. Uh, Marble chimney piece, I dare say, will inflame the reckoning confoundedly. Well, travellers, George, must pay in all places. The only difference is that in good inns you pay dearly for luxuries, and in bad inns you're fleeced and starved. I marvel, Charles, that you who have seen so much of the world could never yet acquire a requisite share of that self-assurance. Oh, the Englishman's malady. <laughs> but tell me, George, where would I have learned that assurance you talk of? My life has been chiefly spent in a college or an inn. I don't think I was ever familiarly acquainted with a single modest woman. Oh, except my mother. <laughs> but among females of another class... <laughs> <mother. laughs> among them, you are impudent enough of all conscience. You could but say half the fine things to the fine ladies that I have heard you lavish on the barmaid of an inn or even a college bedmaker. Oh, no, George, I can't say fine things to them. They freeze, they, they petrify me. Oh, when they talk of a, a comet or a, a burning mountain, but to me, a modest woman dressed out in all her finery is the most tremendous object of the whole creation. <laughs> but at this rate, man, how can you ever expect to marry? Never. <laughs> Unless as among kings and princes, my bride were to be courted by proxy. <laughs> but to go through all the terrors of a formal courtship, together with the episode of aunts and grandmothers and cousins, and, and at last to blurt out the broad, <laughs> staring question of... Madam, will you marry me? <laughs> no, George, that's a strain far above me, I well, assure you. Uh, how do you uh, propose behaving to the lady you'll come here to visit at the request of your father? I don't suppose I shall venture to look into her face. <laughs> <laughs> now, to be explicit, my dear Hastings, my chief inducement down to forward your happiness, not mine. Oh, I am here to forward your suit miss, with Miss Neville, not my, mine with this Miss Hardcastle. Ah, Miss Neville loves you. The family don't know you. As my friend, you're sure of a, re a reception, and then let honor do the rest. Huh? Oh, well, I, a wretch, Marlowe, meanly seeking to carry off a fortune, you would be the last man in the world I should apply to for assistance. But Miss Neville's person is all I ask, and that is mine, both from her deceased father's consent and her own inclination. Happy man. You have talents and art to captivate any woman. I'm doomed to adore the sex and yet... Gentlemen! Ah. Gentlemen, you are heartily welcome. Which is Mr. Marlowe? Mr. Marlowe, sir, you are heartily welcome. <laughs> it is not my way, you see, to welcome my friends with my back to the fire. I like to see their horses and trunks well taken care of. Yes, 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 we approve your caution and hospitality, sir. George, uh, <clears throat> I've been thinking of changing our travelling dresses before the morning. I'm going confoundedly ashamed of mine. I beg, Mr. Marlowe, you use no ceremony in this house. Well, I fancy, Charles, you're right. We must look our best. The first blow is half the battle. Aha, uh -huh. battle. Talking of battle, Mr. Mr. Marlowe puts me in mind of the Duke of Marlborough when we went to besiege Denain. He first summoned the garrison... Don't, don't you think the Ventre d'Or waistcoat would go with a plain brown? He first summoned the garrison... Mm, I think that's ours. Brown and yellow mixed but poorly. I say, gentlemen, he summoned the garrison, which might consist of about 5,000 men. Yeah, what, my good friend, if you gave us a glass of punch before you described the battle, it might help us to carry on the siege with vigor. Master! Uh, punch, sir. Uh, master! Yes, sir, punch. A glass of warm punch after our journey will be comfortable, you know. Uh, master, by your leave, sir. Oh. Uh, cup, sir. Oh, yes, cup, cup. Yes, here's some cup. I prepared it with my own hands. I believe you'll own the ingredients are tolerable. Mm. Mr. Marlowe, here to our better acquaintance. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> well, well, sir, my service to you. 
Hmm. From the excellence of your cup, my good friend, I suppose you have a good deal of business in this part of the country, eh? Warm work at elections now and then, I suppose. I have long given that work over, sir. Ah, you have no taste for politics. Oh, I admit there was a time when I fretted myself about mistakes of government like other people, but finding myself grow more angry every day and the government growing more better, I... Oh, I left it to mend itself. Uh, my service to you, sir. Well, I wait till you lead a good person bustling life of it here, all oh, the same. I stir about quite a deal, yes, sir. Half the differences of the parish are adjusted in this very parlour. Mm, you have an argument in your cup, old gentleman. Better than any in Westminster Hall. <laughs> Aye, young gentleman. Well, here's your health, my... Uh, Philosopher. <laughs> Your toast, sir, puts me in mind of Prince Eugene when he fought the Turks at the Battle of Belgrade. Yes, instead of the Battle of Belgrade, I think it's almost time to talk about supper. What has your philosophy got in the house for supper? Hmm? Supper, sir? Yes, sir. Supper, sir. I begin to feel an appetite. I shall make devilish work in the larder tonight, I promise you. Why, as for supper, sir, I can't well say. My Dorothy and the cook settle these things between them. Oh, they do, do they? Entirely. Well, then, I beg to admit me as one of their privy council. Let the cook be called. Oh, no, no, no. The cook is very uncommunicative upon these occasions. Should we send for her, she might well scold us all out of the house. Bring us your list of the larder, then. <laughs> uh, Roger! Bring me the bill of fare that was drawn up for the night's supper. <laughs> Your manner, Mr. Marlowe, puts me in mind of my, my uncle, Colonel Wallop. <laughs> it was a saying of his that no man was sure of his supper until he'd eaten it. <laughs> ah, what's the bill of fare? Ah, what's this? Oh, for the first course of... A pig and prune sauce. Oh, I blast your pig, I say. I blast your prune sauce. Yeah. Well, yes, gentlemen, pig and prune sauce is very good eating. Oh. Item, a calf's tongue and brains. Yeah, it's your brains been knocked out, my good sir. I don't like them. Oh, clap them on a plate by themselves. Oh. I do. Pray, gentlemen, you are my guests. Make what alterations you please. A pork pie, a, a boiled rabbit and sausages, a, a Florentine, a, <laughs> a shaking pudding and a dish of... Uh, um, tiff, t ah, taffety cream. <laughs> Confound your maid dishes. I'm for plain eating. Oh, I'm sorry there is nothing that you like. Oh, my dear sir, your bill of fare is so exquisite. Send us what you please. And now, uh, to see that our beds are aired and our luggage taken care oh, of. Oh, sir, I must entreat that you leave that to me. Leave that to you? <laughs> I protest, my very good sir. I always see to these things myself. I beg you, sir, you make yourself easy on that. Easy, I'm resolved. And I am at least resolved to attend you.